Okay, go. Can you... Hi, my name is Bill Thayer, and I am interested in becoming a, a, an enrichment lecturer on a cruise ship. So I'm making this short video. It's a little bit uh, about my talk on Amelia Earhart, and it's an introduction of me, just who I am, what I like to talk about are aviation subjects, space exploration subjects, history, and technology. So what I'm going to do today is just talk a little about Amelia Earhart. This is obviously an aircraft aviation topic, and what's my background? Well, I was a private pilot, so I understand kind of what Amelia is going through. I flew from, uh, in 1973, I flew from Los Angeles to New York, down to Miami, and back to Los Angeles in a Piper Comanche. I was also an aircraft uh, aerodynamic design engineer for the DC-8 aircraft, and I was a flight test engineer on the, uh, for the, that was the DC-10 aircraft and design, and uh, flight test engineer on the DC-8. So I have a lot of familiarity with aviation. I grew up in an aviation family. My dad was an engineer for 43 years, so I kind of grew up with aviation. I also uh, did a lot of work in spacecraft. I worked for Hughes Aircraft and communication satellites. I worked with a number of people in the space program and space exploration. I met uh, two of the guys that walked on the moon, Neil Armstrong, and a later mission, uh, David Scott. I worked with several other astronauts. One of them was my classmate, that was Carol Bobko, and he was commander of the space shuttle on three different missions on all three different uh, space shuttles. So I think that was a record right there. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you a couple pictures. I'm wearing a, this is a uh, flight test jacket. It's orange on the inside, so if we go down over the desert, we flip our orange, orange, orange color on so that people can find us. But here I am in uh, the 1960s uh, with my flight test jacket. I'm a flight test crew member. This is ground crew here, and this is the plane that I was flying on out of Long Beach. You know, I talked about spacecraft. Uh, that's dangerous. Uh, uh, test flying is dangerous. Uh, pioneering flight, which Amelia Earhart did, is very dangerous. And spacecraft, any spacecraft flight, is dangerous. And unfortunately, I um, have the, uh, a friend that was on the uh, Challenger mission. This is uh, Greg Jarvis. He was a Hughes engineer, was selected to fly on that, along with a school teacher. This was to demonstrate that. Anybody could fly on a spacecraft. You didn't have to be a trained astronaut as the rest of them were. Unfortunately, due to a mechanical failure, an O-ring failure, the space, spacecraft uh, Challenger blew up on liftoff and everybody was lost. That's just part of the danger. Of course, what I'm going to talk about with Amelia, her flying ended up in her death in the Pacific in 1937. So all these people that are part of the process of pushing back the frontiers of what we're able to do, pushing on a little further, whether it's in space or an aircraft, well, we owe them quite a lot. Now I'm going to talk about Amelia. What was Amelia like? If I had to say number one adjective, it would be daring. She was not afraid to do anything, and I'm going to explain some of the things that she did. She had a zest for life, a zest for adventure. Something new was just a challenge, something she thrived on. She had 28 different jobs. She was proud of that. She was inspirational, and I'm going to end up my talk showing that she inspired one person in particular. She was born in Atchison, Kansas, and her father was a lawyer for the railroads. So they lived in Kansas for a while, then they moved to Missouri, they moved to Iowa, they moved to Illinois, Minnesota. Eventually, when she was old enough, she left home. She volunteered to be a nurse in Canada. So something this is, this is kind of unusual for a woman especially in that time period. As I said, she had 28 different jobs. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of them, just a few of them. She was a nurse. Okay, She volunteered to be a nurse in Canada. She was associate editor for Cosmopolitan magazine. That would be a career for most people right there. That is just one of her 28 jobs. She was a, she, Not only did she do a lot of flying, which I'm going to talk partly about, she was also at the very start of the airline industry. So she was a representative for TAT. Now, nobody remembers TAT airline, but it later became TWA. She was also vice president of National Airline. So she was not only demonstrating flying, she was getting the airlines off the ground. She's one of the people that made airline travel possible for us today. Here she is as a nurse. 
here she is as a pilot. Now, she came to California, unfortunately, because her parents were getting divorced. California, Los Angeles area, was a big area for flying because of good weather. And so she learned to fly at Long Beach Airport. Now, that's where I learned to fly as a private pilot, and I also did test flying out of there. So that's a special place for me. But she learned in 1920. In 1920, my guess is she must have been among the first 20 female pilots in the world, period. So she was right in at the start right in when it was most dangerous. Some of her records, because I've been talking a long time for all of her records, she first became a celebrity and really became well known to Americans in 1928. Well, in 1927, you had Lindbergh, and he flew from New York over to Paris, and that got everybody's attention. So her later husband, George Putnam, was a promoter, and he was looking for somebody that was attractive, somebody that was daring. He wanted somebody to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. Not as, not as a pilot, but as a passenger. And that took a lot of guts because people were dying left and right flying across the Atlantic. So she said, oh yeah, I'll do that. So they flew across from Newfoundland to Ireland. Well, it was cloudy, they missed Ireland completely, ended up in Wales. But nevertheless, she was the first one across the Atlantic that made her a celebrity. And she did more flying. When she was flying across the Atlantic, she was flying across as a passenger, but she was a pilot. So she managed to talk the pilot into, hey, take a break, let me fly the plane for a while. And she flew it for a couple hours and, you know, she said, guess what? I think I can do this. I can fly across the Atlantic. And she did that four years later, in 1932. She was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic. She was, in 1935, just a couple of years later, a different ocean in the Pacific, she flew from Hawaii to California. She was not only the first woman, she was the first person to fly solo from Hawaii to California. In 1937, she's going to try to be the first woman to fly around the world. And how close did she come? She came that close. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about why she didn't make it. In my full talk, I go into a lot more detail. Now, if you'll come forward. Okay, what she did is she was going to do something different. She was going to fly around the equator. Now, the previous flights around the world, the first one being in 1924, flew mostly around the land. And Wiley Post that flew around the world in 1931 and 33, flew, he had to fly across the Atlantic, but once he got there, he flew across Russia, then across Alaska, and back down through Canada. What she was going to do is much more difficult. She's going to hug the equator, and she's going to take three long flights across the Pacific. Each one of these is equivalent to flying across the Atlantic. So this is her plane, a Lockheed Electra. Unfortunately, she was flying first west. She flew from California to Hawaii. She set a record doing that. But on her takeoff from Hawaii to Howland, which was her next stop across the Pacific, she ground looped the plane. And what that means is you're going down the runway like this. You get hit by a gust of wind. You overcompensate and your plane gets turned sideways to the direction of motion, it breaks your landing gear off, you crash. That's what happened. And what she had, she had a casualty on that flight, not that anybody got hurt, but this guy quit. Now, her crew was Amelia, and she was the only pilot, Manning, and he was her radio operator, and Noonan, the navigator. Neither of these guys were pilots, so she had the whole piloting duty. And why do you say a separate radio operator? I mean, pilots do radio today. Well, it was much more complicated then. It was a pretty new thing, so people were trained specially to be radio operators. She took over the duties when he quit, and he said, man, I just about died. I'm going back to being a radio operator on a ship. It's a lot safer. So her crew was just her and Noonan. She chose not to get another radio operator. It was a mistake. Probably contributed to her death. Here's the plane again, the Lockheed Electra, it flies 130 miles an hour. Here's the most difficult leg. Remember now, she's flying east. She's going to fly from New, New Guinea, Lay, New Guinea, to Howland Island, Howland Island to Hawaii, Hawaii to the United States. She's already done this part before. The dangerous leg is here because Howland is a very small island, and this is the longest leg. It's 2,600 miles to go this way. Coming down from Hawaii, it's about 1,500. Going the next leg from Howland to Hawaii is pretty easy because you got a big target. 
It's the Hawaiian Island chain. It's about 350 miles. It's almost difficult to miss it. So if you end up over here in Hawaii because of navigational problems, you can get your way back to Honolulu pretty easy. But Howland Island, Howland Island is tough to find. It's only about a mile and a half long, half mile wide. It's very low. And to make it easier for her to find that island, they had a Coast Guard cutter there. It was going to be a radio beacon for her and also generate very black smoke so she could see that. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to get the radio beacon. She wasn't able to see the smoke. I will explain why. So here's the dangerous leg, 2,600 miles. In, it's 2,570, but it's about 2,600 miles. She, her plane could fly about 22 hours in the air. This would take about 20 hours to fly this way. She would have a two-hour reserve. That means when you get to Howland, Howland, you've got enough gas to fly around for two hours looking for Howland in case it's not where you expect it to be. In actual fact, on her day of flight, she had about a one-hour reserve because she ran into headwinds. But here's the critical thing. If she'd gone west from Hawaii to Howland, that's about a 1,000 miles shorter. And what that translated into is more reserve time, nine hours. So she would have had nine hours to fly around in circles looking for Howland Island as opposed to the one hour that she actually had on the day that she was flying. She went into the ocean because she just didn't have enough gas to search for the island. Here was her plan on the day of flight. She's going to do three types of navigation. She's going to do dead reckoning, which means follow your compass heading during daylight. Then celestial navigation during the nighttime. This is the nighttime portion of the flight. And that's what her navigator, Fred Noonan, was there. He was one of the best celestial navigators for aircraft, period. And then she would come out two hours before landing in Howland. She would use radio direction finding that ought to bring her right into Howland. Unfortunately, and it takes too much time to explain in this particular time, her radio direction finding failed completely. Her radio failed part way. She could not receive. So she was, they were stuck with doing celestial navigation entirely and then celestial navigation during the day, which means you can only sight on the sun. Well, the technique that um, Noonan used in the Pacific, and he didn't have direction finding some of the time, was to head for the island, and then you'd head off if he was going to Wake Island, for example, when he was working for Pan Am, you would head off to the left about 35 miles, let's say here's where he expected the island, and come back down this way 35 miles, because he, he experienced an error of 35 miles right or left. That's about what he's got. And the more efficient way was to go up and down, and he ought to find the island. If you didn't, then you went back to search for it again. That, that was his discipline. Well, what happened on the day of flight due to a, a number of things that I can't get into they didn't go for. They didn't uh, get direct to Howland, and they got pushed off about 80 miles over here, and they went back and forth in the clouds and never saw Howland, never saw the smoke of Itasca. So Amelia Earhart was lost at sea. Now, that's kind of a negative note to end on. So I'd like to end on a positive note by asking: Did Amelia Earhart fly, fly around the world? And the answer is yes. That's kind of surprising. It was Amelia Rose Earhart. Now, I have to explain, she's actually a distant relative of Amelia Mary Earhart, who went down in the Pacific in 1927. And she was born in Downey, California, moved to Denver, became a TV newscaster, learned to fly, and said, you know what, I want to complete Amelia's mission to fly around the world, to show that a woman can do this. So she raised a million dollars, and she did it, just, just exactly what Amelia did. So here she is, completing her mission, here's her heroine, Amelia Mary Earhart, here's Amelia Rose Earhart. She flew pretty much the same route as Amelia Earhart. So I'd like to end the note, this talk, on saying that, yes, Amelia Earhart did perish in the Pacific, but her real mission in life was to inspire people, and she did, particularly in this case of Amelia Rose Earhart. So her spirit lives on. Thank you very much for your attention.